Ian Norman McLeod. Lived- I hate that guy. Oh, already? <laughs> That's very early. He's the worst actor. He was the worst of the three Stooges. He was terrible in every cowboy epic, like terrible human. But you tell us about him. Yeah, maybe I will. Maybe give me a chance. <laughs> Ian Norman MacLeod lived uh, quite an interesting life. Born in 1913 in Yorkshire, he was educated at Ermysteads in Skipton, then St Ninian's in Drum- Dr- Dumfrieshire, Fetts College in Edinburgh, and then Gonville and Caius at Cambridge. These are all Ca- na- names of his Caius? School. Caius. Gonville and Caius. All I'm hearing is Caius. You can study with Caius. At uni, he signed up to study history, but he actually spent most of his time reading poetry, which he supposedly read and memorised a great quantity of, and playing bridge. Uh, In fact, he was actually quite a good bridge player, and by 1936, he was an international bridge player. And at a time when the average male in the United Kingdom was earning like £200 a year, Mm. Um, he was sometimes earning a hundred pounds a, a night um, in his bridge playing. Um, what? Get, yeah, yeah. He bridge playing very lucrative in the thirties. Um, he he is it still that way? Because I, I, bridge is quite funny. I didn't look into that. I have no. I'd idea. be shit. You have to have a good memory for bridge though, and that's just not my strong suit. <laughs> um, he he was earning something like two and a half thousand pounds per year tax free just playing bridge. Um, in fact, he later wrote a bro- book on his winning system, which he called, and I love this, the title is, Bridge is an Easy Game. <laughs> That's the early version of Bridge for Dummies. <laughs> it is, it is. I, I, and look, I get, you know, you're walking through the bookshop and you're thinking, I need to buy a book on Bridge. Ah, oh, Bridge is an Easy Game. That sounds like the one for me. Um, we should change the um, the university logo to ANU is an Easy University. Think of the people we do. No, get. no, we're not doing that. We're not doing that. What do you in, think about it? In 1939, uh, Ian MacLeod went to war, ju- during, joining the Duke of Wellington's regiment, and he did all sorts of war-y sorts of things. Um, uh, I think he was posted in France doing some things. In 1941, he got drunk and attempted to kill his commanding officer because his commanding officer had gone to bed rather than play stud poker with him. Um, apparently, what? apparently, he, uh, he shot his commanding officer's door until his revolver ran out of bullets, and then he tried to <laughs> smash the door down with a heavy piece of furniture. Then he, as in McLeod, <laughs> demanded an apology from his commanding officer the next morning for going to bed. Um, the two men re- re- remain love, friends. Okay, I, 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 I totally recant. I love this man. <laughs> I love this man. Look, um, well. Uh, yeah, I don't t- love I, this uh, man? No, no, look... I'm ambiguous about this guy. And you'll find out something about him in a, in a little bit. But not the next story. The next story, um, he, he was there on D-Day. He landed on the beaches in France. Um, but he can't quite remember what he did. Um, he described <laughs> it later as a patchwork of memories. And this is, yeah. this is his quote from D-Day. I can't remember. Okay, I can remember what I ate, but not when I ate it. Um, and his, um, his, one of, one of his uh, subordinates had filled his ammunition pouch with boiled sweets instead of ammunition, which... I'm, I'm going to stop you there and say, honestly, if I'd been at D-Day or any major armed conflict, historical or otherwise, and someone said, what do you remember? And the, the quote was food-related. <laughs> it just It's just I not know. where I would have gone. It's I know, I know. <laughs> I think I had a sandwich. It was a nice uh, sandwich. It was nice. Yeah. Was, was it a French baguette? No, we didn't get I to baguettes been... for a few days later. I uh, think I had sauerkraut. No, that would have been wrong. <laughs> Oh, yes, yeah, Smedley got his face shot off next to me. Anyway, then I had, a, I, had a, I had some dessert with that. Like, what the fuck? Look, having never been in a war, who knows what people remember, but th- I thought that was a little bit strange. But I think you're right. But anyway, it was after the war that McLeod did two things um, which brought him to my attention in this story. Uh, two things he's probably going to be most famous for afterwards. So after More the famous war, than eating a sandwich at D-Day. More famous than that. More famous than shooting his Big commanding court. officer's door and, being a, and writing the book on bridge. No, The door had it coming. The door had it coming. After the war, McLeod went into politics. And over the next two decades, on the conservative side in the uh, United Kingdom... Over the next two decades, he'd be successively the Minister for Health, the Minister for Labour, the State Secretary, uh, Secretary of State for the Colonies, and Chancellor of the Exchequer. At the same time, he also moonlighted, as many Conservatives do, as an editor of the Conservative or Libertarian magazine, The Spectator. So the other option is, of course, to be a transvestite performer late at night. That's the other conservative uh, moonlighting gig. I don't doubt that he probably did that as well. Um, Just not professionally. So here's the first thing that brought him to my attention. In 1952, the British clinician and epidemiologist Richard Dole uh, proved 
for the first time in the non Ever. well actually not ever uh Ooh. actually i was i was Ooh. just finding this story later um and i this is not the story today but i do love it and i will tell you this story later uh rod but the first discovery of the link between smoking and lung cancer uh was Hitler. yes hitler so we'll, hitler! we'll it's okay to say hitler now uh well, maybe not hitler but friends of his no hitler's scientist but we'll come to that later no not today uh that's a different story but the first um d- discovery and demonstration of the link between lung cancer and heart disease in the west ian mcleod as health Imagine minister lung. He, he said lung cancer and heart disease uh yeah lung cancer and smoking yeah he, the, and also linked to heart disease as well uh ian mcleod as health minister took it on himself to announce this to the world and during the press conference he sat there and chain smoked all the way through, <laughs> cigarette after cigarette after cigarette. So, the second thing that brought him to my attention happened 12 years later. On the 3rd of December 1965, McLeod, when he was still a Minister of Government, but not the Health Minister anymore, uh, wrote a column for The Spectator, inventing a term that I want to focus on today. So I'm going to read the, I'm going to read this um, a bit of the article, the first pa- paragraph of this article, and what okay. I want you to do is guess what he's angry at. So, in my occasion, I, I love this game. I love this game. Okay, yeah, the, I get a pen and paper. Okay, this is going to be a game based episode. So I'll, I'll I'll tell you the rules in a little bit. In my occasional appearances as a poor man's Peter Simple, I fire salvos in the direction of what I call the nanny state. Oh, this was the first use of the term nanny state uh, in print. Mr. Fraser is, although you wouldn't think it, the Minister for Transport. He has come forward with the perishing nonsense of a plan for a something, even on the motorways. Doesn't he realise that this new restriction is as unenforceable as it is undesirable? Doesn't he know that for many cars built today, something is on the normal, is the normal safe cruising speed? Why doesn't he follow his own logic and, in order to cut out accidents in altogether, go back to where we started with a five mile per hour limit at, and the man with the red flag? Rod, Penny, do you want to have a stab? What was he railing against? Speedos. Ah, uh, close. As, as in speedometers, not the underpants. Not the measurement of speed. Well, related to that. So we've started? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to know, you know, in terms of this career-limiting decision I'd made to be part of it, I thought this was philosophy. Yeah. I, that's why the university <laughs> flagged it that way. Join that. Okay, so this career-limiting decision I've made to be part of this as a professor of public health, hello, goodbye career. Um, it won't be that is bad, it speed, Is it speed limits? It was speed limits. So Yay. on the 22nd of December 1965, a temporary maximum speed limit of 70 miles an hour was introduced on the British motorways. Uh, the experiment lasted for... Wait, 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 1965. 1965. They put in, they brought in the concept of a speed limit. So uh, just to, just to, 70. to digress for a second, they had had speed limits before. So yeah. actually the first speed limits were in 1865 when um, vehicles were limited to two miles an hour in residential areas and four miles an hour in... Uh, um, on the open road. Uh, they waxed and waned in the 30s. Um, they abolished speed limits altogether because they thought it was too hard to enforce. Um, but then an increase sure. in deaths um, in the 60s meant that they, they said, all right, all right, let's actually put a speed limit out there on the open roads. So I'll introduce what your goal throughout this podcast in a second. Welcome to The Wholesome Show, the science podcast for people who love their nanny and sit up the back of the classroom. Uh, And has no speed limit, none. No speed limit. Yeah, but we do ask the ridiculous, pointless, dumb and downright offensive questions where possible so that you, dear listener, do not have to. The Wholesome Show is me, Will Grant. I meet uh, Dr. Roderick Griffin-Lamberts and I would like to welcome and say um, happy National Burger Day to our American cousins. Oh. That's hamburger. Wow, is it? Really? I know. And what a great we are thing to celebrate. We are joined today by Penny Hoare, who's just explained if you've been in <laughs> lockdown for two months, you make some weird decisions. <laughs> and one is to join these colleagues in a mystery quiz. Um, but hey, I've lost all my sense of reality. And uh, uh, let's just hope I can um, <clears throat> beat Rod. 
That's oh, all look, I would do. It's fair to say, Penny, uh, up until the point you called us colleagues, I think your career could have been um, pulled out of the fire. But now, <laughs> now, damned by your own words. Penny, uh, Professor Penny Hoare is a professor of public health up at the University of Sydney, where obviously they love um, experimental podcasts. And uh, you yes. know, Penny has taken the plunge here. Normally, The Wholesome Show is brought to you by the Australian National Centre for the Public Awareness of Science. Speed limits. And speed limits. Oh, I don't know if with the public awareness of speed limits, but how about smoking in press conferences? <laughs> Look, you could do that. I, I'm. I think it gets. Harder, I, I, I intend to. I'm bringing smoking back because you know we did an episode a ways back where we talked about all the good sides of tobacco, none of them to do with smoking, but want to bring it back. Penny wasn't there for that. She didn't sign no. up for that. Okay. Yeah. Here's the format for today. I'm doing a slightly different format for you, Rod, and welcome, Penny. Um, I needed two of you for this because what I wanted to do is find all of those times, uh, not all of them, a bunch of times throughout history where uh, idiots, libertarians, conservatives, maybe there's a Venn diagram of the three of them. Maybe they're not. Maybe they're different. I'm just going to look it up on Google. Synonyms. Oh, what do you know? Have screamed, ah, nanny state. Yeah. And it's your job. Rod and Penny, to guess what the example is. Can I be clear? So you're pitting me, a humble senior lecturer in science communication, a.k.a. jack of all crazes, master of none, mm -hmm. against a professor of public health yes. to talk about the nanny state. Yeah, look, but in, in, in her, you know, on your side, if you get one point in front of her, <laughs> then you're sitting pretty. And yeah, but I'm already in front. I got the speed limit right, so. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's true. I, I, speed. I let you have that. I said speedo <laughs> to give you a hint. Uh, nice, nice. So the score, are we counting that first one? I don't know. Sure. I, get, I guess it. I'm the rules guy. One for Penny, zero for yeah. Rod. Now, yeah, just, I'm throwing it down. Just Count a slight it. disclaimer. Um, as I said just before, Ian McLeod invented the term nanny state in 1965. Uh, yeah. Some of the examples I'm using uh, come from before that, but it's the same sort of argument. So they didn't quite have the same language, but they were there. Oh, no, this is fake news. Flawed, flawed test, unless I win, in which case, excellent. Okay. <laughs> All right, you ready to go? Yep. Okay. This first one, uh, again, it's an act of the British Parliament. Was opposed... For being paternal. Wait, 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 wait. How do we do this? Do we just bark it out or do you wait and we do it in order in a civilized fashion? Um, <laughs> do we have a bzzzt, a bum? Bark it out, bark it out. I don't mind. Um, an act of the British Parliament was opposed for being paternalist and despotic. Landowners appealed to the primacy of private property and freedom and argued that what was proposed was a very expensive principle, a very unsafe principle and a very unsound principle. Mm. Uh, the people were clever enough to manage their own affairs. An opposition uh, member of parliament and, in fact, the inventor of Munt's Metal, that's just an aside. Uh, Monks Mental. Munt's, M-U-N-T-Z, Mr. George Munt's. So his last name oh, is... Munt's. Munz Metal? Yeah, probably. Yes, Munz. Munz. Munz Metal. Okay, he was, Munz the, metal. He was the inventor yeah. of Munz Metal, and then he went into It's parliament. my favourite subgenre. <laughs> uh, Hans didn't tell us about that. Uh, no. He opposed the bill, declaring that there is a mania now for sanitary measures. Mm. In fact... Toilets! There, oh, we're getting close. We're getting close. Fuck. In fact, there was an insanity insanity. Hmm. When, when was this? 18... 40. Uh, oh, go Penny. It's 80, definitely 1840. 1848? Yeah. Oh, my God, Penny, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was 1840. Is it clean water? Is it the clean water or something like that? It's, it's part, yes. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that because we'll come to – I'll tell you one last um, uh, person ca or organisation campaign against it was the Times of London who declared that a little dirt and freedom was more desirable than no dirt at all and slavery. Wow. So it was to get them to clean up their water supplies. Yes, it was. Yeah, it it yeah. was the British Public Health Act of 1847, 1848. Originally, it was called the Health of Towns Bill, but it was the mm -hmm. first major... Penny, am I right here? One of the first major public health acts. Yeah. So this was in response to John Snow, right, with the Broad Street Pump. Yep. And so he was the guy, He's you know, there's a pub in Soho named after him. So it's, we really know how to honour people that have done something good. Is it called the Collar and Pump? <laughs> If I do something good in public health, they'll name a, a pub after me. So there's a John Snow 
pub in yeah. Soho in, in England near Broad Street, which is the um, local uh, neighbourhood where Jon Snow had observed an increase in cholera deaths compared to other parts of London. And he said, hmm, I wonder if it might have something to do with them all getting the water from the common water supply there. And maybe if I take the handle off the pump, people won't be able to use it and cholera rates might go down. And that's exactly what he did. And he proved the association between the, the, um, the, the choleric, whatever it is, the bug in the water and, um, and, and cholera. That's the good news. The bad news was it took 30 years or so for them to then implement the, you know, the, the findings fully. And these days it, we've got it, it's a little bit better now. It now takes us 17 years between a scientist showing yeah, us. There we do. And 21st us, century and for us the doing wind. something in health. It's a 17, the Institute of Medicine in the United States did a big study and said it's 17 years. Some people are saying it's getting a little bit better now. Oh, wow. It's well, this is this is what I loved about this. So, so this act was put in 1847, 1848. Um, so, it gave the government um, powers over water and sewage systems, um, which as uh, it was a huge cause of death at the time. Um, so, local boards were authorized to regulate drainage, the water supply, sewage, slaughterhouses, mm. things like that. But mm. um, they they put it in for a, a temporary period, and in 1854. Um, so just six years later, uh, Parliament refused to renew the Act beyond its initial term. And the Times celebrated this in an editorial which read, we prefer to take our chance with cholera and the rest than be, bu- <laughs> than be bullied into health by Mr Chadwick. <laughs> Isn't that Nothing's wonderful? fucking changed. It just, <laughs> just swapped London with anywhere in the US. I also like to, you know, make a, a few points of order. One, I said toilets, half a point. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Right. Two, two, two. two to, I'd like I'm to give you two halves because you said speedo before. So that's that's a, a you know a rough enough for for a science communication lecture. He was talking about a bathing suit, but nonetheless, <laughs> I often do though. That's that's a bit of an obsession of mine. But the, that's a different podcast. The other the other point of order I'd like to draw to, uh, and the, the like complaint I'd like to make is that I'm hopelessly out of my league. Yeah, I, I get it. In I, this competition. Look, look, and mate, that has already been made apparent, and therefore I think I should have a handicap or penny should. No, no, I think we should authorize Will to do the scoring like they do in QI. Oh, look, where probably where random. Where there doesn't seem to be any relationship between it, it, what it almost say. doesn't matter. But you yeah, know what? I'm yeah. gonna give I'm gonna give Rod half points for, for both speedos and for toilets. Um, and I would like to thank both of you to for patronizing me and treating me like the nanny state, <laughs> but I, I'll take I'll take the points. I'll I, I do I do have to give Penny. An extra bonus point, though, uh, for getting, oh, getting good God, getting it down to the year. Like, I... <laughs> why not give it ten more points for being a professor in the discipline we're discussing? Yeah, a so, big fish. A so big fish. this, a big fish. A big fish. Yeah. This next, this next act. Um, again, we're staying with the United Kingdom because because okay. um, early developers of the public health world and early developers of the nanny state uh, nanny state critique. Now, I don't have heaps of arguments against this act, um, and I will give you the clue. It's in. You personally a- don't, or you haven't found any. No, I haven't found very many, but I found I found one. Right. Um, and and the interesting thing about this one um, this one quote against the act. So the act was in 1872. And this one... Kenny already knows the answer. Come on, just buzz in, Kenny. This act was opposed by a bunch of different people. But but a quote here by an Anglican bishop and who later became Archbishop of York, William Connor McGee. It turns up on inspirational posters still. Like I was Googling around to find, okay, where's... Oh, where, I know where, this one. Where, where's Hang this? in there. <laughs> Fake it till you make it. Uh, was this before no, capital punishment had been removed? Uh, pain is weakness leaving the body. I don't know. Um, oh yeah, it is. <laughs> I'd rather that England should be free than that England should be compulsorily sober. With freedom, we might in the end attain sobriety, but in the other alternative, we should eventually lose both freedom and sobriety. Anyone want to? Is guess? it? Can I? Can I? Is it something to do with alcohol? Yes. There Half you go. a point. Half a point. Over to you, Penny. You know the answer. <laughs> Yeah, how did, when did they did start bringing in um, laws to stop people? Was this for one of the first gin, gin, gin to do with gin? No, it actually, it's it's later than that, but, but it is a good mm. one. Uh, so I, mm. I like this because it's the Liquor Licensing Act of 1872, which among other things, okay, it did, did some boring stuff like restricted pub opening hours. 
Yeah. Stopped publicans adding salt to beer to make you thirstier while you drink. <laughs> Which I, I did not know that as a dirty trick. Like, yeah, what, how, how, how yeah. drunk are you that you don't taste the salt? I think Coca Cola still does it, doesn't it? They have salt in. I, I think there goes that sponsorship. Thanks. Man. <laughs> Also, also, this is the best bit of it. Uh, 1872, uh, the Liquor Licensing Act prohibited children from drinking spirits in a pub. Oh. Fair enough. They're kids for fuck's sake. Wine, yeah. beer. I know. Um, I know. But outside a pub with a shandy. Okay. Or in the beer yes. garden. Yeah, spirits in yeah. the beer garden. <laughs> Where, where's your eight year old doing shots? When did you say that was? 1870? 1872. Okay. Right. So the most recent is us seeing the lockout laws in Sydney. It, it is a parallel. Mm -hmm. It is certainly a parallel yeah. there. Not, not so quite children. Just to but... clarify, just to clarify in the context of the competition, I said something to do with booze, half a point. Penny didn't know anything. Penny got zero so, on this one. I so I think I'm in the gracious, lead. No, yeah. you're one and a half. Penny is two. Oh, did she get a bonus point? <laughs> Um, oh, it also, do you want to, okay, it, it, you can, here you go. You, it fined people for being drunk in a public place while in charge of a what? Bicycle. No, horse. Uh, horse was in there, but not the not not my favourite one. Uh, Ooh, a sword. <laughs> Drunken in charge of a. It's not a horse, not a bike. Carriage. No, when is it? Carriage was in there. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, All right. The ones I like that that, that I was going to give points for, but it's a bit hard to guess them because you already did guess things that were in there. Uh, while oh. in charge of a cow or a steam engine. <laughs> <laughs> That's to, so to be good. Fair. That's so, that's so specific. You can imagine just different sides of Parliament arguing <laughs> whether or not we should have the cow in there. Know. You know, that's a thin edge of the wedge, and then we're going to do goats, and there's the goat lobby. What next? You know, and <laughs> you imagine the, the voice from the back of the room, I'm worried about men, gentlemen who are drinking, having steam engines. So what kind of steam engine does the honourable gentleman refer to? <sighs> also, I think, honestly, when it comes to steam engines, I should be fine for just having one, Betty, being drunk in charge of one. Did you have those little toy ones that you used to be able to get? I don't know. Maybe Will, you weren't born, and Penny, you were. What, what sort of size are we talking? Like you, we're talking a kid like, can sit in them, or uh... yeah, no, no smaller, like a, like models that were about maybe a foot and a half long. Yeah, okay. And you put like metho in them, and there'd be a little boiler, and oh, yeah. you could get them going. And I was fascinated by these things, but they weren't super safe, <laughs> especially in the hands of a let's say an excited eight year old. So they could blow up. I, I yeah. yeah, I was, I was. The Consumer Protection Act probably got rid of them. I was hearing point. the yeah. I, was, I was hearing the little <laughs> little boiler and yeah yeah yeah, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. It, yeah. It, it's it's making pressure. Like seriously, steam engines are not a thing that kids should have as a toy. Oh. But so like no one should have it as a toy. Drunkenness just adds an extra layer of danger that no one should be subjected to. So I'm not against that part of the I, act. I do have to the say the cow, that. however, I object to. I'm, I'm not going to hang out with the cow unless I'm drunk. Okay, okay, Penny, one day, uh, I haven't got any more on this, but one day I'd like you to come back and we'll do another version of this episode, but on toys that have been banned. Rod, if you happen to find examples, we can, I, I just... Okay, spoiler alert, I'm, I may have started to look into that. <laughs> oh my God. All right, oh, just one final thing. If you were drunk in charge of a cow, um, yep. you would receive the maximum fine of level one on the standard scale, which... <laughs> currently equates to um, either 200 pounds in today's money or mm. or 51 weeks in prison wow, wow. i know That's uh, I, uh, it's it's 51. you don't get that now like some bastard shot a whole bunch of eagles up on his lot in in um in north in northern victoria and the biggest fine they could give him was something like two thousand dollars there was no question of going to jail oh, about know. And this is just drunk in charge of a cow. And you can Slaughtering go. something. Ugh. Mm. All right. All right. Where are we sitting? Uh, Penny's on like three and Rod's on like... Uh, 14. 14 or something like that. Okay. All right. Give or let's, Give or let's fast forward to another example of paternalism run rampant. The act of a nanny state restricting freedom of choice. Out of curiosity. Yes. Paternalism, nanny state. Uh, Not grandpa state. Yes. Why isn't it grandpa state? Uh, or you know me. Or, I'm striking a blow for the for the ladies out there. Or That's flipping garbage. it around. Why isn't it? Why isn't it maternalism? I don't know. Because men are fuckers, and we do that. I, I accept the paternalism, but then why isn't it grandpa state? Yeah, because it's all just about accusing people of abusing their power. I mean, maybe we'll have an interlude and get a chance to talk about the the, the nanny state is such a clever 
Oh. Meta- metaphor to put on top of us. That's that's that, that, I'm, I'm giving you, I'm giving you a prelude. We will come to that penny definitely. Ooh, okay. I, no, no, no. <laughs> but we, we can do it anytime you want. But definitely, I do no, want no, to no. unpack a little bit about the cleverness of the nanny state. Yeah, um, it's critique. Fantastic. Okay, where is it? Um, so this one, you can find most of the elements of the nanny state argument, and there's a few different bits to this that stack up. It's slavery. It's a slippery slope. It won't work. Um, and also, the, there is the argument in here. It's good, but don't make me be good. So. Uh, one, it sounds like everything I said in high school when I got in trouble. <laughs> Pretty much covered the lot. I'm good, this but is don't slavery. Make- it's good, but don't make me be good. <laughs> You're not my real dad. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize I was such an advocate back then, but it turns out. Uh, what do we got? One, one opponent uh, in New York argued that this measure, like George Orwell's 1984, is a warning. It's a warning about the future of human freedom and the respect Ooh. for individual dignity. Ooh. Another legislator in Illinois. If there's ever a bill that said that Big Brother is here, if there's ever a bill that said that 1984 is the appropriate year for acting on this legislation, this is it. Uh, wow. North Dakota. Public nudity. This is about public nudity for sure. No, no. Uh, oh, sta- no. State Senator Parker said it should be my choice, not the state's choice. Uh, in Missouri. Public nudity. Um, the measure represents a surrender of, of a cherished freedom. Um and Again, I don't see how I could be wrong. Yeah. Cherished freedom. Any any guesses so far? Okay, no, you okay. could probably work a little bit out based on the year. Might might. What uh, is the year again? So 1984. Uh, yeah, they've been they've been saying 1984 is the appropriate year for enacting this legislation. So. Oh okay. Oh yeah. All um, right. So is it yeah. some form of gun control or? Um, no, no, not not in America. No, I'm, no I'm, gun control. I'm gonna I'm gonna actually blend because this this discussion mm-hmm. is not one si- one si- single act. It's one development that happened in a couple um couple of countries at roughly the same sort of time. I'm gonna blend some arguments from the UK and from America. Only if you do the accents. Ah, uh, no, I'm not gonna. <laughs> I you know um gun right, gun uh, gun. So there's a, there's a couple of different ways um that they opposed it. So first of all, there was that argument that that it's good, but don't make me be good. So, for example, Ivan Lawrence, um, a conservative MP in the UK, we are yep. not anti something. It, we it. are we are on the contrary, overwhelmingly in favour of them. We agree with the medical profession's powerful powerful lobby, but vaccination, vaccination. No, no, no. no. Uh, Norman, then it must be circumcision. <laughs> um, because that's yeah, let's go. Okay, so other people said the same sort of thing, you know. Um, Norman Fowler was a Secretary of State for Transport and opponent of the bill said, I hope that nothing is said tonight will challenge the proposition that these things provide protection. And that's a matter of common sense. Oh, but frangers. Again, frangers, oh, yeah. Nice, no. Um, but here's, no, it, here's the bit. Uh, what lot, else provides protection? Condoms, guns? A lot of people, a lot of people said, education. I'm worried that they're dangerous. So Illinois State oh, Senator... Oh, oh. Works. No. No. Illinois State Senator Geo Karras uh, told his colleagues, <clears throat> I can name five cases that I know where something would have subjected the occupant to be burned to death. Uh, seatbelts. Yes. There we go. Yay. That was a good call. Uh, yeah. Well, actually, not just seatbelts, but mandatory seatbelts. Yeah, so mandatory seatbelts. New York, New York State Assemblyman Barnett knew of two situations personally where lives were saved by not wearing seatbelts. Others wrote to their congressmen saying... <laughs> you got to love that. In the country of, what, 398 million people, I can give you two. I'm not kidding you, not one. Two examples of a lot this of people, A lot of people put these in. Um, if I had been wearing a seatbelt, I would have not been able to get out of the car. And here's my favourite. one. Yeah, mem- because those buckles are so damn hard to operate. <laughs> I know. They were- you got to push a button. My daughter, on one occasion, omitted wearing her seatbelt and was able to fling herself into the back of the car and save herself from serious injury, if not death. From I don't know. The car was crashing, and she said that. Uh, um, is that? Are you sure it was because the car was crashing? Because that seems like a very scanty on the detail. <laughs> okay, but someone was shooting at her or something, maybe. Oh, maybe. Okay, I don't. So have mandatory the full story. seat belts in in which which mini? Where are we? So this happened in the, U- the United in, States in the UK um, in uh, 1981. So just after Prince Charles and Di's uh, first wedding. Or their wedding, Prince Charles's first wedding. Yeah, they only got married once. I'm yeah, pretty just, confident. Just the once. I, I, I'm not a royalist, but you know. Uh, so just up, but um, the US implemented laws um, uh, from 85 in New York 
Um, and then other states followed pretty soon. As late which, as that, because yeah. we were so early. Um, we were 60s, weren't we? We were like Snowy Mountain. Um, 70s, yeah. It had something to do with the Snowy Mountain Hydro Project or something. People were. What? Seriously, there was something to do with seatbelts. You come to Australia, you've got to wear a seatbelt, mate. <laughs> Only no, if you're working uh, in Snowy Hydro. No, no, no. It was two. It was two. I mean, there'd been suggestive campaigns before that. There was these two um, doctors in, in uh, Melbourne who basically was so sick of having to stitch people up. Um, afterwards or yeah. or for them to die on the table that they went straight to the premier and said come on like with, and so with the political will um and the evidence that it was going to work um they just did it they just legislated it, it and then they threw the police in afterwards because just legislating it <laughs> makes, no, makes no difference but if you if you do um um, te- um in, enforce it um with police then and they can you can get fined for it. Then it works like a drip. Like Some a people child. actually raise that as a as a reason that um, that it wouldn't work because it would be unenforceable and police wouldn't mm. want to. Some people said um, mm-hmm. that it would damage community relationships with the police if they had to enforce this and police. Yeah. Uh, so. They're at an all-time high in the United States right now. Mm-hmm. So some other, some other That's arguments. That's the one that... and only only time that argument's been used. Obviously, oh, that it's doubt. unenforceable and it would damage relationships. Um, so others can you, said, that can you imagine a, getting in a car? Can you imagine getting in a car and not automatically putting a seatbelt on, like as a matter of complete instinct? This is the thing for me. I mean, it's so many of these things I accept. And there's one example I will come to later of a policy that um, don't ruin it. Let Penny guess on her own. Yeah, no, no that's, that's later. Um, <laughs> but so many of these examples, you just think, wow, people argued against putting a seatbelt on. You know, come on, come on. Is that or people argued against having a speed limit? Like I, I, I accept. Uh, two, two words for you currently. Face mask. I, I, yeah, well. You Nazi bastards want me to wear a face mask. I'd rather shop somewhere else. Like, cool, fuck off, mate. Like, the, the, the things that people can get upset about yeah. never ceases to amaze me. Everything new. Everything new. Yeah. And, and, and making people do it. it just, wow. So uh, one of the argue, other arguments that is, is an interesting one, um, some people said that seatbelts were a moral hazard. Um, in the se- <laughs> <laughs> In the sense, what are they doing with them? Or what do they think people are doing with them? Come here, sweet. I've got a seatbelt for you. (laughs) No more in the sense that um, (laughs) it will make you feel more secure and therefore subconsciously you'll start taking more risks. You'll you'll be reckless. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you put on a seatbelt, boom, unprotected sex. That's what basically while while driving heroin at 70 miles an hour. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, That's true. Whenever I put a seatbelt on, I do feel fairly invincible. Uh, oh yes. Every time I get a seatbelt on, I smoke a packet of cigarettes. It's just the way I roll. I take it off. I recognise it's dangerous. Same with a bike helmet. I put a bike helmet on. There is nothing I won't do. <laughs> oh. yeah. um, Sorry, the bit of bit of self disclosure there. No, that's, you know, that's, no, the, no, that's the way no, I roll. It's, it's, it's I roll. interesting. It's interesting because there's a few. That's like a side effect. One of the side effects of public health can be that kind of. Um, identity change that goes with the behavior the compulsory behavior you make mm. someone do something compulsorily and there's a kind of an identity shift in that one of the bad side effects of um so is that a legitimate worry that we no, well it, no it is people people observe it they um so one of the things when we made it that you couldn't smoke in workplaces um and you had to smoke outside mm. um smokers started going outside and standing around and um they started to form identity, you know, realizing who were the other smokers in this workplace, relation, you know, talking, chatting. And what used to be a behavior ended up becoming an identity and a label. And, you know, and an identity with a few smoker. extra little positives in the sense that um, a lot of people a lot of people would get a break for smoko, but if they weren't a smoker, you don't get that that five, yeah, break five minute break yeah, every hour yeah, or something like that. Yeah. So all these things, you know, they have effects, but they have side effects as well, you know, and uh we should always look at the side effects. Well, I had that um, when when bike helmets first started to appear in Canberra, back in my little hometown, it was early 80s. I was a high school student and I used to ride my bike to school. And we only, my mother didn't know the reason we did that is because we'd sneak aside and have a cigarette on the way to school <laughs> for our health. And she said, no, I want you wearing a, a helmet. I said, I'm not going to do it. You know, screw that. It's not the law. I'm not wearing a helmet. She said, no, I want you to wear a helmet. She started getting really mad at me. And finally, I said, okay, I'll wear a helmet if you get me either a World War II German Stormtrooper helmet. Nice. Or a oh, Kaiser yeah. Wilhelm helmet, yes. you know, with a, with a spike on the top. 
and she started making inquiries. Oh, <laughs> so I could have, and if, if I'd actually got a World War II German stormtrooper helmet, I would have worn that bugger all the way I to feel, school. I feel like, I don't know, if I'm if I'm the police and I'm seeing a kid riding along with a, with a, with a, with a, World War II, anyway, a spike you? over the top, I'm like, what are you doing, mate? What are you doing? I get well, it. Even better, even better. Riding to Canberra's most expensive private school. <laughs> in, so in my, in my Punzi Grammar uniform with my fucking World War, my, my Kaiser Wilhelm spike up the top on my yeah, Apollo 2 10 speed race. People would try and run you over. People would try and run you over. Look, it would have been fantastic. My God, punk, the kudos. Though. The kudos. Oh, yeah. 1982, looking like a boss. So it does change your identity too. I would have <laughs> worn that kind of helmet and it would have actually enhanced my identity, something wicked. So, seatbelts, have they been a good thing? Uh, yes, I know this one. One point to me. There you go. I don't think that was for points. Um, well, if, if, if <laughs> you want, Benny's for <laughs> uh, Here's That's a stat. been fabulously successful. Between... Oh, you're trying to tell us. <sighs> well, yeah, oh, yeah, I was just going to say how fabulously successful you wanted to say, Benny. Well, I've got one that's between 1983 and 2001, mandatory seatbelt use in Britain present, prevented 50,000 deaths. Um, wow. Well. And a whole bunch of other things. So I assume fantastically successful around the world. Fantastically successful around the world. We were the first. Australia was the first. Victoria was the first. So it was really good. But I have to say, when I watch um, movies and and old ones where they get into a car and they don't have a seatbelt, I sort of yeah. feel it. You know, it's 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 it, it's become such a customary behaviour. I, I think it's so funny. I mean, mm. I remember seeing a documentary on this a while ago. It was about the attitudes to the ro- road toll uh in the 50s um in america and probably around the world but you know america was a clear example of this and cars were just just astonishing death traps there was a whole bunch of um you know people getting impaled on the steering wheel column or people getting decapitated by glove boxes that popped open and they just didn't even count these things they were just like how short were these people it was the kind of thing that people would die in crashes at 30 kilometers an hour or something like that or 20 you know the kind of crash where okay it's a bonk or something like that but people are just getting maimed by the cars around them because they were Mm. so unsafe wasn't that part of that whole attitude was the way to make a car safe was to make it really, really resistant to any kind of crumpling or impact. Yeah. I, make it make it a metal box tank arrangement so that there's no question the soft, squishy stuff in the middle, aka the human, just got smacked around backwards and forwards between these unyielding surfaces. I think it parallels Genius. with I think it parallels with um the herd immunity philosophy of someone like Boris Johnson. You know, let's just get the disease and get through it and we'll be tough. Well, and it's working. <laughs> Look at the UK going great. Oh dear. All right. Okay. Here's, here's and Penny, Penny's out. There goes the career. She didn't say anything on that. Nothing controversial. She did. She said, oh, dear. <laughs> okay. Here's, a, here's another example. Very explicit screaming of stop this nanny state. Uh, opposition to this policy commenced as soon as the Australian government a- announced their intention. So one company launched a campaign centred on an overbearing and intimidating nanny who looked like sort of the trunch bull from uh, Roald Dahl's Matilda. Matilda. Um, they had the No Nanny State campaign. Another cam- company launched a, an AstroTurf campaign saying, I deserve to be heard. What they're, Do we they're, get a year on this or is that will that ruin it? Uh, well, um, You don't have to. I'm just, just checking. Some, some of the, uh, some, if, if we don't get it, that can be a clue. Keep going. Um, Good point. Where, 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 where was I? There we go. Um, so an AstroTurf, AstroTurf campaign, I deserve to be heard. They were saying the, the, the victims of this policy uh, deserve yeah. to be heard, but they felt the company was the actual victims here. Um, and um, the Australian newspaper ran dozens of articles against the policy, front pages, a bunch of editorials. In the Daily Telegraph, Miranda Devine wrote, surprise, surprise, the nanny stake uh. strikes again. So yeah. anything that is sensible, that doesn't narrow it down. <laughs> Some kind of you, people to have freedom to say horrid things about people. Is that what they were uh, against? It, um, could, it could be. It could be. Against, um, the, next, the next clues might get a bit closer for you. Uh, the Institute for Public Affairs of Public Affairs, for public affairs. Uh, this is such a hit list of fucksticks. Well done. I'm, I'm really excited. <laughs> yeah, n- now my career's gone. Yeah. The, 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 uh, <laughs> the, what, you were getting paid by them? No, 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 no I'm just saying, now they know that I associate with people that say those things. But <laughs> I'm, I'm probably on a list anyway. Penny, it's technically true. They are fucksticks. Yeah, and they are a hit list. And I don't mean that because I want them killed because that would be wrong. The argument for this change is one of the most stark examples of how nanny state regulations treat individuals as childish automatons. Uh, they, mm-hmm. they tried to argue that it wouldn't work and it would be costly. So, for example, Tim Wilson, 
who now is a member of parliament, but then was director of intellectual property and free trade unit at the IPA. Ironically but, named title, carry on. Yeah, pointed out that the British government had tried something similar, but because um, but they'd given it up because of a lack of evidence that it would was work. Was it about um, gender, um, having um, laws that don't, um, you know, oh. Oh, okay. oh, interesting. Uh, they IPA funded polling that said that 66% of Australians do not believe this will be effective. Uh, they also pointed to the... Voting? No. They pointed to the potential cost, saying Australia's obligations to compensate uh, the affected companies could cost $3 billion annually. So we're oil or non-renewable related energy stuff? Coal? I can't think of... Smoke? Oh. Not allowed to slag off a company or um... slag away. No one listens slag to this podcast a... anyway. It's just us. Mm. Well, no, the... no. I'm saying this is what this is the legis. How can the, how can companies be worried about? You know, this is this is good. Cigarette related. This is, cigarette this is related. Good, cigarette, this is good. It's cigarette related. Cigarette yes. related. Yes. Oh really? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Five points with my handicap or with Penny. That's five. What points. was it then? What was the? So the year is 2011. Yeah, plain packaging. There you go. Oh, plain packaging. Oh, well done. Australia. Penny, I want half your professorship. Is that cool? <laughs> We've destroyed it already. It doesn't, it's not worth anything. So Australia's Toba Tobacco Plain Packaging Act of 2011 uh, yeah. prescribed the colour, shape and appearance of tobacco packages, including the labelling of tobacco brands and variants, suppressing trademarks and other brand characteristics. Yes. And so that was what the IPA was, um, well, in part what they were fighting against. Do you know Sa what they forgot to say? The, 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 the real objection. IP. The sensible objection is cigarette packets looked fucking cool. Like they were amazing artifacts. They were very interesting. Tom Robbins yep. wrote a book that basically focused on a whole camel packet. Half the story, um, Still Life with Woodpecker, was all about oh, don't this doubt guy it. who was it, in it, isolation. It, it was a century. They look wonderful. It was a century of branding, of course. Yeah. They're amazing looking objects. There's no but then, question. But then that's why as a, as a government and as a public health oriented state, getting rid mm. of all of that branding makes people. 100% you've got to get rid of it. There it was, was no so question. Clever. It was yeah. such clever legislation. It was I genius. It. Yeah. Wonderful. That's great. Mm. Uh, the, 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 the IPA still continued to, and probably still do continue to fight against it. Um, all right. Good luck. So it, they cited some data to say, um, it didn't work, including a 21-year-old Brisbane finance worker who claimed she'd switched to a cheaper brand, smokes more often than before, and none of her friends had quit in the wake of the policy change. Ah, uh, it's the Kerry defence. Mm. <laughs> Kerry didn't. <laughs> Kerry smokes more now. You guys are fucked. Oh, dear. Everything about what you've done is wrong. Um, uh, so Apologies to Kerry, uh, one of our top Now, I've got, I've got some data that was straight after this, but I'm sure there is much better data that has, has stuck in. Yeah. So, so calls in the four weeks after the legislation jumped by, uh, to the quit line jumped by 78%. Um, hmm. Sustained impact over 43 weeks, probably a sustained impact over the last nine years. Hmm. Um, yeah, brilliant. Uh, no, no rise in these cheap Asian cigarette imports. I love it. It just seems close to racism, but I, I don't know. Um, no, it's just descriptive, like most racism. I'm not. I'm not. It's not a value judgment. I'm just describing it. <laughs> um, and in uh, in 2012, the High Court in Australia rejected the lawsuit by the tobacco yeah. companies, claiming that yeah. um, the their intellectual property had been compulsorily acquired. 2015, both the Irish and UK parliaments passed standardised tobacco legislation of their own. So, yeah. uh, governments Fantastic. around the world are looking at this. Do you well know? Well done, Nicola Roxon. Absolutely. Either Penny or Will, probably Penny, at the same, how closely uh, linked was when they decided to hide them from display as well and put all the cigarettes behind like cabinets and stuff. In, in yeah, shops. that helped as well. I don't, I mean, there's a wonderful That graph. came later? That was before. Yeah, that was before. So okay, the restrictions right. were, the, the supply restrictions access were on before. There's this wonderful graph of his smoking rates and here's them going down and then it's got all the different bits of policy over 30 years yeah. and it just start it just wipes it out unfortunately though the tobacco industry is just doing fabulously well in um, developing countries so yeah. it's just shifted it all uh, this is what happens we solve problems in developed countries and they get um, yeah. ex exported to developing countries so we've still got a bit of a global battle there quite a big global battle so I don't have, I don't, this next one is not actually, this is just a more extension of this current one. So it's not actually a question. I just wanted to, I just wanted to put it in this. Uh, is that because I, d I just like won? Uh, it's just, no, and now no, you're no, taking no. it away no, from no, this, me? This, I, I just wanted to, I found similar rhetoric um, around the time when tobacco advertising bans um, in sports oh, yeah, and yeah. things like that. 80s? Was that yeah, 80s? In the 80s, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. 
Um, so there's it's no this, longer the Benson and Hedges World Cup of cricket. Well, exactly. That was it. Um, so this, even the songs, the, 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 like the actual songs, what is it? B and H are putting up the World Series Cup, and they were literally even colloquializing the brand names and stuff into the jingles yeah. for the sporting event itself. Yeah, it was no joke. Fabulous. It was I'm, I'm sure a huge, a huge development in getting, getting you know their favorite bit of advertising being associated mm. with sport. Um, mm. I love, this is Jim Clarko, um, who is a member of parliament in Western Australia, was a member of parliament in Western Australia back in the 80s. Uh, I, I love the name Clarko as well. I don't know how that was His possible. actual name is Clarko. It's not his nickname. Jim Clarko. That's You're kidding. Clark? Yeah. Oh. No, no, not Clark, not not. Oh, what an Aussie he is. The only thing better would be Clarky. If the the government was serious and its arguments were really about health, it would ban the use of tobacco products. To give some idea of how draconian this legislation is, I point that in the future, a cigarette manufacturer will be unable to print his name on a letterhead in Western Australia. Here, here, says everyone around there. He'll not be able to put out an annual report. Better still, says everyone. With the name of the company on it, the same or similar to the name of the tobacco product. I also understand that the tobacco companies will not be allowed to be registered in the Western Australian Stock Exchange, nor will the share price of a tobacco company be quoted in the newspaper. Heavens above, the people of Nazi Germany were sheer amateurs compared <laughs> with the government and what it's trying to do here. Wow. Can I clarify? He was saying all these things as negatives rather than positives. Wow. Uh, he was, what his, his argument was, um, if you're actually serious, you'd do it properly, but you haven't got the guts to do it. And so he's sort of doing well, this Therefore, dis- don't do anything. That's, yeah, not you're bad, love that. that's not a bad, we should come back to that. Um, one of the, I mean, clearly, one of the great things about, they used, that there was a graph, there, and there is a graph, there is statistics that show that it, or when all the sporting codes, you know, all the big football codes were, were sponsored by tobacco companies, yeah. that South Australians, Victorians, New South Wales, Queensland smoked more of that brand. Like yeah. there was a direct relationship between who was sponsoring the sport and the brand that was smoked in Australian states. So that was, you know, it was wonderful to get rid of it. It's almost the, like it worked. I mean, this is the thing about advertising. <laughs> you know, it's it's great. but You, you don't need evidence. The evidence that, is the fact that they spend so much on it. They want it. They really want that advertising. Yeah. That, that is yeah, evidence, yeah, yeah. isn't it? Or it's a, that's but part the, of the accusation evidence. that government should get out of it altogether, we, I mean, in a sense, we should come back to that because if we really were nannies, states, we would not We would be better nannies than we are. We're, in fact, quite governments are actually should be more accountable for who they are vulnerable to in mm. terms of the big the big um, lobby groups and uh, and we have not banned things that are clearly addictive like tobacco smoking um, yeah. and uh, and then we can talk about gambling gambling oh, I'm doubt that there will be a lot of things that 50 years back will be like you were still doing that back then come yeah. on come on but I love as well you don't uh, a member of parliament diving in there with the uh, similarity huh. to Nazi Germany is a, is a huge call. Um, Godwin, oh, yeah. Godwin's law, I don't think, was invented. There was no. another, the amendment enables the minister to declare items of apparel that should not be on the list, which is a Hitlerian, Hitlerian, Goebbels, Hitlerian. Goebbels type arrangement. Hitlerian. <laughs> Hitlerian. I it's, don't use that term enough. <laughs> Hitlerian. This is Hitlerian. It sounds so sophisticated. No, it it's sounds funny. It's giving him way more no, credit than he's due. That's when Hitler makes a joke. It's Hitlerian. I don't know. Hitler- yeah, I see. I see. Hilarious. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah sorry. It didn't, no, no, it didn't work. No, it didn't work. I think just you know. I'll move right on then. Walk away. No, from look, that it, it half landed, but one of the oh. wheels blew out. That's cool. That's cool. <laughs> okay, here's another one. Uh, we'll start with a Vox Pop uh, that was printed in the Daily Telegraph. Uh, the author of this Vox Pop was Kells Bells Bills. I don't know if that's a real person, but anyway. They should something. No question. Kells Bills Bills, owned by, uh, what is it, spawned by Clarko. Yeah, probably. Uh, they should something, dams and lakes and waterholes and, oh, maybe puddles. A child can drown in a puddle. It's <gasps> it's ridiculous. Pool fences. Stri- Pool fences. There yeah, absolutely. Well done. Uh, Actually, this was actually an amendment to pool fences. Um, all, all the, all the amendment oh, see, was. If Penny had said pool fences, you'd be like, "Yes, Professor, two points to you. Rod's an idiot." <laughs> I say it, and it's like, "Oh, you only got a half right at best, a quarter point." <laughs> you bloody got it. That's fine. Favoritism. Yeah, we're, favoritism. Giving it, we're giving it to you. I don't um, want it anymore. It seems insincere. So, pool fences have been as a as a requirement had been around for ages. In 2016, there was legislation that they had to be, they have to have a certificate of compliance. You can't just have a bodgy pool fence that doesn't work. Mm. And so <laughs> all sorts of uh, right-wing media, including Miranda Devine again, um, yep. were railing against it. Does the government seriously expect people to fence their pools around a $60 inflatable paddling pool? Welcome to yes. New South Wales, the nanny state. Why not, why not fence the Sydney Harbour while you're at it? Okay. There's also a whole lot of, um, I blame the parents. 
you know, whenever, whenever anyone drowns, oh. there's a whole, all of these Vox Pops are all like, we don't need, yeah. we don't need fences. We need better parents. And it's like, we need better parents. That's what they always do is they push it onto the parents. Like Fence the parents. You know, that people fence off the top of the, um, the gap and they fence off the, um, uh, the Grand Canyon with the view that because it's a safety barrier, you know, <laughs> and people accept that. But yeah. then in their own backyard, while they're off having a Chardonnay, they don't realise that their kid could be getting in the pool. That's exactly what happened. Yeah. Once you've lo- just one kid, you know, and it's preventable. It's and, and also, but, but but to be fair, there are a lot of there are a lot more children. Who who? I mean, you know, let, let's play the percentages. You lose a couple. Um, <laughs> I mean, we know how to make them. Again, Penny taps out of the podcast. Yeah, that's right. When I, hello, viewers. When I said this was a career-ending moment for me. <laughs> You didn't agree with me. You're safe. safe. (laughs) And this is the thing. I get it would be vaguely nice to stroll directly from your deck into the pool without pausing for half a second, but wow. Wow. Do you know to use those indecipherably complex pool gate latches that you're obliged to have. I mean, really, you need a PhD in locksmithery. I don't have yeah. I don't have the stats on how many lives uh, pool fences have saved, but I guarantee you uh, it's quite a few and they are yeah. inordinately yeah. children. Little little yeah. kids like yeah. the pool fences. The drownings, saved- we've still got drown- loads of drownings now happening, but not through, through fencing, just mm. through um not knowing how to swim. Yeah. Uh, and childhood alcoholism. Can't swim. Yeah. Indeed. And being in charge of a cow while uh, yes. while being a child. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Here's an, here's another one. In February 2014, Australian federal parliamentarian Ewan Jones MP called for something to be scrapped. It's tough enough being a fat guy without the government telling you you're a fat guy as well and that everything you eat is wrong. He said I'm, I'm obese and I carry a lot of weight. I'm not fat because I'm stupid. I'm fat because I eat too much. If I go through the drive through at Macca's, it's because I need a guilty treat. It's not the government's fault I'm fat. It's my fault and I, and I live with the consequences. Was this the investment in the National Prevention, Prevention Health Agent, National Preventive Health Agency? No. Because no, they scrapped that in that. 2014. Uh, that was... That, uh, um, okay. Mr. Sorry, what were we, 2014? 2014. Yeah. Mr. Yeah. Jones conceded that, okay. that government does have a role in health. Uh, that role does not extend to putting great big something on my food. Labels with the uh, bout of kilojoules. There you go. Uh, front wow. of front of pack nutrition <laughs> labels. So, but they're not even effective. You see, that's they the not? thing. They then, well, they're hardly they're hardly effective. You know, they when people yeah. have done this is the thing. People have. Can I give a little rave here? Yes. Um, oh, yeah. So in there's this country where I was reviewing their, some, a grant application from Can we guess the country? Do I get points no, if I no, guess no, the country? No, I can't tell you where it was. <laughs> Suriname. Uh, Suriname. And, and the the people, the applicants, the research applicants put in a fabulous you know, proposal and they also said this is what we're doing for the last five years and this is what, what we want to do for the next five years. For the last five years, they had been doing some fabulous work pointing out and demonstrating how much obesity would be solved if we did government regulation like of the food and if we restricted advertising, like if governments actually did what they could do to the top level, how effective it would be. But the reason why they were now applying for another five years of funding was to try and test less effective interventions (laughs) because governments were not willing to implement what had been shown to be effective. So they wanted to do stuff on labelling. They wanted to do stuff on texting people. They wanted to do stuff. And we gave them a lot. I recommend they give them a give them the money but because it's politically being able to show that this doesn't really does not work but it, i was so incensed because if this was cancer treatment researchers would not be asking for we want to go for the third best fourth best or fifth best solution yeah. <laughs> we they always go for the top, the top solution yeah, yeah. but in prevention because of the how effective the nanny, nanny state labeling is people are being pushed into assessing the effectiveness of self-regulation, like self-regulation of food industry, labelling, um, which is tiny, tiny small effects, um, randomised trial showing it doesn't make much difference. Um, there has it been- can go the other way. That's what I love. I'm, I'm going to cut into your rave because I actually, <laughs> I actually know some stuff here. The, the thing I like most about labelling, you know, these health star ratings, for example, you know, is it healthy from one to five? The, the evidence that suggests people go out there and if they see a rating on it, 
it's better. Even if that rating is like oh, really? half a star, as long as it's rated, <laughs> it's better than a thing that isn't rated. So you've got a zucchini so that must be zero. with no rating. Yeah, yeah. There's a zucchini with no rating. There's a packet of chocolate biscuits with a half a star because it's yes, got some yes, that's packaged carbohydrate. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so people go, well, obviously the uh, packet of chalky biscuits is better than the zucchini because it's rated. Oh, my God. It's got, it's got a star rating like, like yeah, the yeah. movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like and that's movie. literally, that's, oh. there are literally well, the, um, experiments that demonstrate this. So it's fantastic. The self-regulation, the, this bunch of people in New Zealand actually have done some nice stuff showing, you know, let's saying, okay, well, let's have a look at what the impact of these bloody star ratings are. And um, two years after the implementation, only 5% of the packaged food had the labels on it in the first place. That's yeah. that's the self-regulation. And it didn't lead to, you know, hardly any, you know, changes in the, in the purchasing behaviour, but it has led, to give them credit, to a, some reformulation of the food to reduce the salt a bit. But, you know, I think there's something like a 4.6% reduction in the salt if they're, if manufacturers are forced to put these labels on them um but it's given that only five percent of them do it it's you know we're talking about tiny tiny effects when in fact if you put salt you know if you have a salt reduction reformulation policy led by the government mm. you know the the impact's huge actually i think you know, 18 percent or something reduction in in um, high blood pressures i mean this is huge you know, and you know the other thing penny i mean as much as i like to you know pick on people uh who are in front of me I've been sticking up for your your profession quite a lot in the last few oh, weeks in media and so forth, because uh, you flagged this, you know, the cancer thing, they want the top treatment. People want the most amazing yes. thing in the world because that shows people not dying very, dis you know, very clearly. Your problem, unfortunately for you guys, is it worked. <laughs> How do you know? Nothing happened. <laughs> I know, and that's been going around it? so much, so much with yeah. the, the whole pandemic thing. I mean, Absolutely. It comes up all the time. It's like, how do you know it worked? Because nothing happened. Or well, piss off then. You're like, no, no, seriously, nothing is good. Yeah. That's the result we want. <laughs> oh, there's so many people. I mean, this is the thing that inspired me to do this topic. You know, so many of these uh, conservative libertarian types who are like, well, we probably need a few more deaths to, to really balance this out. You know, it wasn't, yeah. wasn't worth it until you've demonstrated enough deaths to make this worthwhile. Yeah. Wow. Well, what was it, Stalin, that said one one death is a tragedy, uh, a, a million, million deaths is a statistic. Is statistic. Yeah, supposedly. Um, yeah. Yeah. Stalin, supposedly. Stalin supposedly. either did or did not say that, but it's still a good call. Yeah. Well, I don't think we have we have good data on what Stalin said at all. I ah. think that, the, but it's about this epidemic thing. It's exactly right. People are comparing what is with how how life was with how it was how life is now with how it was, say, maybe last November or December. And yeah. what they should be comparing it with is what it could have been like if we, if we hadn't intervened. Very hard for us to imagine, though. I mean, that well, way, not not for us, for other people. Yeah, but, no, no, but, but we're not designed no. that way as, 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 no. as a species. We're not designed to imagine that kind of thing. Mm. All right, you we, want another we one? We weren't designed at all, yes, dude. Please. Okay. We weren't designed. We weren't designed. We evolved. Oh, yes, that's true. I, I agree with you there, Rob. Uh, in 2020. Like another point. In 20. Uh, <laughs> 2012, the Centre for Consumer Freedom. I'd like you just to just imagine what type. Oh, of, what a great what name! What type for an organization. of organisation that, that yeah, is? Yeah, they're going to be great. Um, and and who they might be funded by. Uh, Good people ran a full page ad in the New York Times. Um, so this ad is a classic of the genre. Uh, combines a nanny state panic, assertions of patriotic freedom, arguments of a slippery slope. So it's got a picture of uh, then New York City Mayor uh, Michael Bloomberg. In an outfit a lot like uh, Mrs. Doubtfire. Oh, big drinks. Giant. Got it. Giant. There you go. Soft drinks. That's it. Okay. Oh, portion control. Was portion it? control. Yeah. yeah. So, oh, great. Uh, so it says here, the nanny, you only thought you lived in the land of the free. Nanny Bloomberg has taken, taken his strange obsession with what you eat one step further. He now wants to make it illegal to, I wrote something here now. I've got to, you know. Stuff. The, yeah. To have a one liter big gulp. Uh, one yearly big, big gulp. Uh, what's next? Limits on the width of a pizza slice, size of a hamburger, or amount of cream cheese on your bagel. New Yorkers need a nanny, not a uh, mayor, not a nanny. Um, wow. How's that? So he's a guy and he's still a nanny, not a, not a, not a grandpa, not a grampy. Uh, yes. Uh, you know me, I'm a, always looking a whole for bunch in, of, inequities. There's a whole bunch of sexism in this as well. So, But isn't it funny, even when it is the the man Bloomberg, they also nanny, call nanny Bloomberg. Yes. Um, I mean, why, right? Well, why? because because there aren't um, those archetypes out there in society that are. We need as, to build new ones. 
Probably, probably. You go write something about a, a, a terrible male um, patrician or something. I, I, Where am I going to find subject matter for that? It's going to be impossible. Yeah, I don't want to dream up a better version of the nanny metaphor. No, no. That, <laughs> that's a very that, good call. That this would ruin working. your career, Penny. That, that, this that one's would working be it. very well for them. Yeah. So, yeah, the, the law was an attempt to limit cup size um, in sugary drinks to six, yeah. 16 ounces. I don't know what 16 ounces is. Um, that's about nine litres. Yeah, to nine litres. Um, but the law didn't last very long. Um, the New York uh, Court of Appeals um, overturned it, saying that the regulation exceeded the scale of the regulatory authority. So there's there's one that was wound back, um, potentially as part of the because of the campaign, but potentially for other reasons. Wow. All right, here's one where Michael Bloomberg was a little more successful. Um, no. Condoms. In, in, no. In no, November 23rd, 2003, the expatriate British journalist and political commentator Christopher Hitchens went on a crime spree in New York City. Uh, fed up with the capricious and petty laws of Michael Bloomberg, uh, he set out to break as many as he could. Uh, and he, he blogged about it or he wrote about it in Vanity yeah. Fair for his time. So he, uh, he sat on an upturned milk crate. I don't know how that was breaking the law, but anyway, he took his feet uh, off the pedal. Upturned, so he sat in the hole of the milk crate. Yeah, that's what I... <laughs> it seems really awkward. <laughs> and he wasn't a slender guy, so... With his like his legs in the air, his knees in his face. <laughs> this is a protest. Certainly is. Uh, what do you? He took his feet off his pedals while riding a bicycle. He sounds very Boris Johnsony, and engaged in some loitering uh. by sitting down on the subway steps. But here we go. After securing the permission of other patrons, Hitchens then something in a restaurant denounced. He lit up a cigarette. That, no, that's it, Penny. There yeah. you go. Right. So that, this was. Um, I was going to say did a crap on the table. So Penny's Penny's answer is much. Yeah, better I think than mine. you probably gave me that one. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know if you can really get the permission of the other patrons in a restaurant to crap on the table. But <laughs> Have you tried? I, I know I haven't tried. And to be honest, I'm not going to. I can imagine you're out with your family. You go, can you just hang on? I'm just going to talk to the tables around me. So you came back. It's okay. They said it was fine. <laughs> Look, if someone did ask me and. <laughs> <laughs> Let me think about it. No. <laughs> That's not a long pause. But Hitchens, Hitchens, you know, had a way. Yeah. Uh, yeah, secondhand smoke laws. So I don't know when they were brought uh, in. Secondhand, in, okay. In Australia. Do so, you mind if you breathe off the oh, end of my Oh, no, I know the yeah. story about that one. Can oh. I tell you about yes, that? Yes, oh, indeed. One, one, of the, one, one of the best things that happened in relation to that. So in New South Wales, at least, um, the people were trying to campaign, you know, just using very ineffective methods because that's all was politically acceptable um, mm. to try and get people to stop smoking like you know stop smoking campaigns edu you know education campaigns blah blah yeah. um, but the New South Wales health was really really wanting to introduce um, laws in relation to secondhand smoke and um, uh, because the, I mean the, it, there's an increased risk of cardiovascular events like it's you know secondhand smoke 15 percent increase in cardiovascular cardiovascular events you know and you're, you're not even a smoker so yeah. you know that, that they wanted to um be able to bring this stuff in but the best thing that happened to them was a psychologist that was working at new south wales health said to the um chief health officer that she actually had to resign she felt really badly about this but she has asthma and she just can't go to work anymore like you know it's just too hard for her to, to wow. work um and it's wow. it's she's sorry she really likes her job blah 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 and the chief health officer said i tell you what will you sue us um oh. that would you know that would be really helpful <laughs> and she did so she my sued, god i want to work in a place she like that sued new south wales health is providing an unsafe work Fabulous. workplace for her and then new south wales was able to use that as the legal precedent for other workplaces wow. she went she went on and be, um, and served on the board of the australian consumers association wow. because wow. she was you know obviously a clearly you know a, a good advocate and um and it was a great opportunity to tell those stories so that's brilliant so Seriously, we've got up workplace got innovation up though door, legislatively through that kind of sneakiness that's so amazing great. i just love the idea of a boss will you we, looking for a while could you please <laughs> To us. I'm trying to get fired. Can, can, I need you to come into my office. I, I, I want to talk <laughs> about your workplace story. behavior. Could you sue us? You'd be really doing us a favor. So uh, tobacco tobacco continues to cause the death of around 6 million people per year, of which 10%, I, I, this is the stat I've got here, I don't convert, 
uh, quote me on that 100%, uh, which means 600,000 non-smokers are exposed yeah. to secondhand smoke. So, yeah. you know, laws about this, stopping secondhand smoke, and, and of course, those are global stats. There is a long way to go on this. Um, mm. You know, that, that's really unfair. You know, um, if you How smoke, can you argue against it? Sure, it's like you, you, are you, you, can ag- you can agree that smoking hurts a person because of the smoke. Yes. And then you're around smoke that you haven't, you haven't got the cigarette in your mouth, but you're breathing in smoke. How do you say oh, that smoke doesn't hurt me because I didn't light the cigarette? Yeah. Like yeah. it's, it's a wild argument. Yeah, it was I don't, I don't even once know they were even... able to show it. Once they were able to show the impact of secondhand smoke, it made it just much easier because before that you could say it's people's personal choice to expose yeah, themselves. Yeah. yeah. Um, but once, once, once you're harming others, um, then this, this is interesting. This is interesting because this is one of the few nanny state arguments um, that pulled apart the libertarian thing because oh. a libertarian argument, you know, traditional sort of uh, classic liberalism of John Stuart Mill says, um, I'm allowed to do what I want so long as it's not har- harming anyone else. But mm-hmm. secondhand smoke, this is why they were really troubled by it, yeah. is directly harming other people. So not only... Um, it's, yeah. Hitchens was arguing that non-smokers should be obliged to put their health at risk at risk to accommodate him. So yeah, um, that went well. Well, he died. I think well, indeed, cancer. indeed, he did die of cancer of the esophagus um, about seven, and, seven years. And after in that. the process, yeah. he recanted his views. He actually said that that he was sorry um, that he ca- campaigned against um, the Bloomberg's. As much as he did, that he could see the point. Yeah. Because of the addictive, because tobacco is so, so addictive. So well, he was also, he, I mean, he made his reputation as a contrarian, and sometimes it was amusing and clever, yeah. and sometimes less so. Yeah. Yeah. But also, but I mean, the, the secondhand smoke thing, I mean, I used to bounce, I, I was never a cigarette smoker. I used to bounce I in the bar. You smoke on the way to school with the bike helmet on. Oh, the- that's true. That's true. As a 14 year old, I had a couple. He just I held it in his mouth. Yeah, I didn't inhale. <laughs> Yeah, okay. <laughs> but um, I used to work in a bar that had such bad um, ventilation, secondhand smoke wasn't an issue. And I'd be standing in the door, like, you know, vetting naughty people, etc. And even standing in the doorway for six hours, there was so much smoke in that room. I would come home, my underpants smelled like they'd been dragged yeah. through an ashtray. Yeah. Yeah. And that wasn't a normal thing for me. Yeah. yeah. It amazed me. I mean, you want the, the potency of secondhand smoke. You, you, you're freaking knickers. I, I just your remember as well. I, 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 I must have been... 19 or 20 when um, when laws against smoking in, in pubs and nightclubs came in. And so yeah. we, we'd had like a year or two of, you know, 18-year-olds um, going out drinking. And so we knew what they were like, really smoky environments and our yeah, under, yeah, yeah. Underpants, underpants smelling like that. All of a sudden you're like, whoa, it doesn't have to smell like that afterwards? That is so yeah. weird. Only one yeah. downside. You can't smoke a joint at a concert. Yeah. I, well, I'm talking about for other people, not me. Yeah, Penny, yeah. You're, you're not right. So, so, so you've heard. Yeah. 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 So this a was a friend of mine. This was part of, really. um, I've got the quote from Hitchens uh, recounting. Um, he uh, said, I've come to recounting. this. Pe- I've, I've come to this particular tumour honestly, he told Anderson yeah. Cooper. <laughs> if you smoke, which I did for many years very heavily with occasional interruption, and if you use alcohol, you may make yourself a candidate for, your, for it, and he meant cancer, in your 60s. I might as well say to anyone who might be watching, if you can hold down on the smokes and the cocktails, you may be, may be well advised to do so. Anderson wow. Cooper responded, that's probably the subtlest anti-smoking message I've ever heard. So, <laughs> <laughs> he died at the age of 62. And yes, he, he did recant. But yeah. Ian McLeod never did. We started the episode with the health minister who chain smoked through the, the meeting. He, yes. died, he died young of a heart attack at the age of 57. What? So they're wow. unrelated to cigarettes. It was just the stress of the job. There are a whole bunch, and Penny, I'm sure you've got some great examples of other places where uh, where people have screamed about the nanny state. So sugar taxes going on now, lockout laws, cigarette advertising, random breath testing, airbags, motorbike helmets, uh, bike helmets, of course, e-cigarettes, firearm restrictions, gambling restrictions, junk food advertising, tobacco advertising, alcohol advertising, Michelle Obama's healthy eating campaign. And this, this, this one got me. So she was not putting in policy. All she was saying is it'd be great if we ate a little bit more healthy. And Rush Limbaugh come, came out <laughs> kind of like a ton of bricks that, that, that she has no right to, to advise us to eat healthily. What a fuck. Like, seriously, people, get over yourselves. 
so the, the idea you would resist just for the sake of resisting now is like I know, calm I know. calm down it's it's the the willful eating of something unhealthy just because the other side of politics are eating something healthy and so, and, and that is part of the you know this current um, uh, libertarian plague going on in America willfully not wearing a mask because it were, because the other side are like a mask is a political statement as opposed yeah. to I'm trying to protect my health or so other that's, people's it's that ironically is coming down to the whole childishness of it which yes. is you know that bloody minded childishness and and like i saw a woman with a big sign up saying my body my choice you know when she yeah. was talking about i'm thinking yes but you're a vector it's you know yeah. it's not it's not just a choice for you yeah. you are transmitting this virus to other people so it is oh yep. it's astonishing so so penny i got a question mm-hmm. for you and i've got i've got some stuff here and, and rod and i probably have lots of opinions uh and you've you mentioned it a little bit. Why does the nanny... That'll why, be a first. <laughs> why, why, why is the nanny state framing so powerful? Why does it work? Oh, well, it's, it's powerful because I think it completely... It, it, if someone's basically telling you that you're an idiot and, you don't, and you're being treated like... Someone is treating you like an idiot. Someone thinks you don't know how to make decisions for yourself. Um, you, you, you should be cross about that. I'd be incensed, absolutely incensed. But the mm. reason why it's so, it's so, it's really powerful, but it's actually also wrong. Like the, we're not, the nanny state is uh, like a side effect of what the government is actually trying to do. The, what the government's really trying to do is that there is a limited amount of resources that we've got mm. in order to protect the health of the population. Mm. And we want to use those resources really well. So we don't want to waste them on things that don't work. So education yeah. campaigns do not work, but legislation to re, to you know recalibrate the salt in food or the, or put a tax on sugar does work. And um, so all we're trying to do is be good stewards of taxpayers' funds and maximise opportunities that that people have. It's um, but making it look like we're doing it because we think people don't know how to do it. Of course they know how to do it, and that that we're not in that business, but. Yeah, that's why it's really clever. It's mm. it, it's it's actually not what we're trying to do. And you guys, literally, I mean it. I've I've been like I said, I I, I tout the 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 horrible dilemma and, and the, the the knife edge you public health folk are on, because you know if you're right, nothing happens, and it's it's a terrible thing to try and balance. How do you cope? Yeah, well, I think you, do, you walk in the garden and you plant <laughs> herbs. I mean. <laughs> How do you cope? Well, the people in, I, I, I think what's really odd for us is we're used to being, like in my, I mean, I'm, I'm getting right towards the end of my career. During during my- Especially career, now, yes, I understand. <laughs> as I mentioned, hmm. the, during my career lifetime, lifetime, pretty much no one have, has really known who we are or what we do. Like we, hmm. you know, we just get on with the business. You know, my parents never really knew what public health was. You know, they wished I did something that they could explain to their friends or, or you know, and all this kind of stuff. You, you had this kind of career where people don't notice what you do. It's hard to explain all this kind of stuff. And then the next thing you know, have a world pandemic and everyone's an armchair if you didn't. Oh, I love it. Every, everyone <laughs> yeah. is suddenly that, you know. Yeah. And everyone's an expert and everyone's telling me. And I thought, wow, uh, you know, and there was a nice little joke thing on the ABC the other day that people couldn't even spell the word epidemiologist. Yeah. And and now they but, can. But Penny, next time there is a <laughs> some sort of financial crash, and I get that yeah, there is one going on now, but it would be good if you all dived in and became armchair financial experts or, you know, just... <laughs> You get to get an honorary free pass. Yeah. Oh, I think sure? one of the things, things though, I'm, I'm enjoying, and it sounds bad, but one of the things I'm enjoying about this epidemic is seeing people that have been top of the world trained getting a chance to have their advice implemented. Yeah. You know, yeah. so some of the people... I'm seeing on television were students when I was lecturing and you now see them up there and they're being listened to. And mm. people are also realising, I think, the gravity of the sorts of decisions that we make because one of the things that, or that we recommend, uh, one, of the, one of the things that is often pressed upon us is why don't we learn from business people? You know, why don't we, why don't we take advice from, <sighs> you know, the people on the Senate or the people who have set up the Institute who made a load of money in business? <laughs> and and there's a certain degree of success in business that only comes from doing what I would consider to be very small things, which is, you know, to attract, you know, two percent of Pepsi Colas, Pepsi Cola people to start 
purchasing Coca-Cola. You make fortune out of that. Mm. But, mm. but we have to make 100% of the population well and make all those trade-offs that you're hearing people make. Um, and that's, that's different. It's a different type of expertise. So it's, it's really exhilarating to see it being put into practice and seeing it work um, because it's working. That's awesome. All right. Well, uh... well, sorry about killing your career then, because it sounds like it's actually starting to take off. Like, <laughs> you finally found value, and here we are. Boom! All you had to have was a global pandemic. You know, that's <laughs> is that too much to ask? Once in a hundred years. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Penny. Um, hopefully, you know, everyone can go out there and recognise that so much has been done uh, with good spending of your taxpayer dollars to achieve mm. public health outcomes. Ignore that screaming about that nanny state. It's true. And if there's one thing I've learned, it's wear a condom. Indeed. Indeed. Oh, who won? Um, oh, I think we know. Yes. This guy. Yeah. <laughs> no, look, I think in the end. Um, it was a tie. No, in the end, no, public health was, was the winner. Public health and democracy. Yes, and, yeah, and public. Voting, yeah, and voting. Yeah, Absolutely. Well and, Absolutely. And obviously Penny. Um, I just want to, I just want to, as we go, um, there's a bunch of site, uh, sources for this episode. I'll put them up on the website. Uh, one in particular by RS Magnuson, case studies in nanny state name calling. What can we learn? Oh, also Karen Jockelson, uh, nanny state or steward. Um, uh, she dived back to some of those early historical examples of people screaming about sewage and wanting the they cholera. They were wonderful. They were wonderful. Yeah. So you're good at this. You should do this almost professionally. Oh my god, almost professionally is my goal. Yeah. <laughs> the wholesome show is me, Will Grant, him, Rod Lamberts, joined today by Professor Penny Hoare, and we're brought to you by the Australian National Centre for the Public Awareness of Science. And answer condoms. See you later, listener. Thank you. Bye.